Let us pray. Señor, que las palabras de mi boca y las meditaciones de nuestros corazones sean aceptables ante de tu divina presencia. In two days, we will mark the 38th anniversary of the martyrdom of Oscar Anulfo Romero, who advocated human rights and justice for the poor, but was given a bullet to the heart. Romero, who took up the cross by standing with people living in a world of violence, poverty, and social inequality, often said, when the church hears the cry of the oppressed, it cannot but denounce the social structures that give rise to and perpetuate the misery from which the cry arises. On March 24, 1980, Romero was gunned down shortly after a sermon given in an evening mass in the chapel of the Divine Providence Hospital. When shot, he was carrying out his mission celebrating the Eucharist for the deceased mother of his friend, Jorge Pinto, the owner of a newspaper called El Independiente. In his sermon, Romero made reference to the sacrament as an act of faith that nourishes us so we can give our body and blood like Christ for others. After inviting the congregation to pray, a single shot from a military assault rifle rang out. The beloved bishop who preached nonviolence and peace in a time of hate lay bleeding at the feet of Christ. The killer's bullet entered his left breast and lodged in his back. Romero, who saw Christ in the poor, the displaced, the mistreated, the tortured, rape victims, children and youth, was murdered for giving voice to their cries. The bishop whose faith compelled him to speak against the greed and arrogance of the wealthy died within minutes from blood loss. Romero often said to the vicious oligarchy and military controlling the country, Christ is the homily that keeps explaining to us that God is love. Christ is God's homily preaching to you. The murder of Romero plunged the country into a civil war that left 85,000 dead, more than 10,000 disappeared, and one and a half million Salvadorans displaced, 25% of the total national population. Considered and martyred in ecumenical circles whose canonization, the final step to sainthood, is imminent, Romero's murder was never brought to justice. We know that the architect, the author of that murder, is Major Roberto de Buzon. Romero was Archbishop of San Salvador for three years, and in that time, his Sunday sermons issued forth from the cathedral, touching the hearts of the large majority of Salvadorans who lived in the shadow of the country's frightening military control. He sided with the poor who were being brutalized by state repression, confronted the powerful for their treatment of them, and was slandered in the conservative press. He was falsely accused of provoking class struggle and labeled a psychological misfit because when a young man, he had received psychotherapy. Salvadorans, even in remote villages, heard Romero's preaching while the country's adversarial bishops complained their faithful were being seduced into listening to Romero's subversive broadcasts. After the diocesan radio station was bombed to prevent the transmission of his sermons, he recalled the words of Paul in a homily, we are persecuted but not forsaken, struck down but not destroyed. Romero was a nonviolent peace worker who told the truth and urged conversion for those who departed from God's ways. Once the mild-mannered pastor understood the condition of his people and witnessed violence taking the lives of 3,000 Salvadorans a month in his first year as archbishop, he became a prophetic voice for subjugated peasants organizing for land reform and social change. And he often said, the church does not approve or justify bloody revolution and cries of hatred, but neither can it condemn them while it sees no attempt to remove the causes that produce the ailment in our society. You should know Oscar Romero 
was born into a simple rural life on August 15, 1917, in the village of Ciudad Barrios in the mountains of El Salvador near the border with Honduras. The small family home had neither electricity nor running water, and the young Oscar slept on the floor with his seven other siblings. His parents could not afford to send him to school at the age of 12, uh, past the age of 12, so he went to work as an apprentice carpenter. Interesting. He showed a high level of skill in carpentry, but Romero was determined to become a priest. He, he entered seminary at the age of 14, trained in El Salvador, then completed his theological studies in Rome in 1942. While others were leaving Italy, he remained. Remember, the Second War, War was on the way. At the age of 25, he was ordained a priest, served as a parish priest for 25 years, auxiliary bishop in 1970, and four years later, appointed to be bishop to the See of Santiago de Maria in Usulután, a town in southeast El Salvador, which included his boyhood village. His eyes were then beginning to open when he witnessed the misery of the peasantry and saw the murderous repression they suffered at the hands of the security forces. In 77, Romero was installed Archbishop of San Salvador. In the midst of political upheaval following a fraudulent presidential election and massacre of protesters. In the country, a popular nationalist slogan at the time was, be a patriot, kill a priest. Everywhere, the ongoing passion of Christ was played out daily on the lives of the poor and Christians working for just changes in society. In the midst of political violence and church persecution, Romero would courageously say, peace is not the product of terror. Peace is not the product of fear. Peace, peace is not the silence of cemeteries. Peace is the generous, tranquil contribution of all to the good of all. Now, Romero was elected archbishop by Rome because he was timid. He was conservative. He was adverse to politics, safe, and most comfortable inside the walls of the church. He was not a political activist, but a critic of them. He was supposed to correct priests who had gone too far in identifying with the suffering of the people and relating the church to the world. Months before Romero became the Archbishop of San Salvador, the government, the wealthy and large landowners responsible for attacks on priests, religious orders, institutions, and faith-based organizations were pleased that Rome had elected Romero as the next Archbishop of San Salvador. Members of the traditional power structure believed Romero would return priest to the sacristy and restore a pastoral approach contrary to that outlined by the Second Vatican Council and the Latin American Episcopal Conference held in Medellin in 1968 that made a preferential option for the poor. In El Salvador, activist Christians expected an unpromising future with the bishop from Santiago de Maria, who preached against what he called then hate-filled Christologies, the Christology of liberation. No one imagined Romero leading the church to advocate the rights of the poor and appealing to the Salvadoran oligarchy and military to stop the violence. Most of the oligarchy was shocked when in the cathedral, Romero said, to try to preach without referring to the history one preaching sin is not to preach the gospel. Many would like a preaching so spiritualistic that it leaves unbothered and does not term idolaters those who kneel before money and power. Romero embraced a very traditional theology for years, but his conversion, what he referred to as his evolution to the world of the crucified came on March 12, 1977, less than three weeks after being installed Archbishop, when his friend, Jesuit priest Rutilio Grande, a 15-year-old boy and a 17-year-old farmer were killed on the way to El Paisnal 
for mass in Aguilares. Grande was murdered by a government-sponsored death squad for speaking against the authoritarian regime's repression and empowering poor farmers to feel a deep connection between their struggle for justice and Christ's suffering death and resurrection. In his last sermon, Grande, he preached, I'm quite aware that very soon the Bible and the gospel won't be allowed to cross our borders because all the pages are subversive. And I think that if Jesus himself came across the border, they wouldn't let him in. Without any doubt, they would crucify him again. The priest's execution was a clear attack on the church's preferential option for the poor, and it permanently altered Romero's relationship with those controlling society. Romero confided to a friend on the night of Grande's wake, feeling a divine inspiration to take up a strong stance against violence in the country. And with a broken heart at Father Grande's funeral, Romero shared, let us not forget, we are a pilgrim church. Exposed to misunderstanding, to persecution, but a church that walks peacefully because we carry within us the force of love. From that day, Romero tirelessly preached the violence of love that wills to beat weapons into sickles for work, as he said. Six weeks following Grande's murder, Romero, who had dined with the military, condemned the message of liberation theology, issued his first pastoral letter, urging Salvadorans to take up Jesus' radical demands expressed in the Sermon on the Mount. Grande's death caused a tremendous shift in Romero's thinking, allowing him to understand the forces that brought Jesus to the cross, the social forces of greed and arrogance were responsible as well for the increasingly lacerated reality of El Salvador. Salvadorans would say of the bishop's conversion, God enlightened him to the reality of life. As Archbishop of San Salvador, Romero became an extraordinary pastor who lived the gospel in terms of the love and concern for the poor given theological expression in scripture. He began to perceive his first death threats in letters from death squads with names such as the White Warriors Union, saying he was at the front of a group of clergymen that at any moment will receive 30 bullets in their faces and chests. Threats did not prevent him from speaking the truth and defining the church in terms of its solidarity with crucified people. A few weeks before his murder at the University of Lavan, where he received an honorary doctorate for his human rights work, he explained, in the name of Jesus, we work for a life that is not reduced to the frantic search for basic material needs. It would be the most profound blasphemy to forget and to ignore the basic levels of life, the life that begins with bread, a roof, a job. When the church inserts itself into the socio-political world, it is given testimony to its faith in God, Lord and giver of life. There can be no neutral ground here. Either we believe in a God of life or we serve the idols of death. Romero was critical of those in society who thought the gospel did not condemn their acts of criminality toward impoverished people. He saw Christ in the faces of those harvesting coffee, cotton, sugarcane, children with nothing to eat, and the abused who asked the church for their voice to be heard. He lived the demands of the gospel by becoming good news to Salvadorans kidnapped, horribly tortured and raped, and regularly killed with terrifying methods such as decapitation, impalement, massacres, machete, hackings, or executions at the hands of privately financed death squads. Amid blood and sorrow, Romero explained, those who believe my preaching to be political and provoking violence as if I were the cause of all the evils in the republic, 
They forget the word of the church is not inventing those evils, but is just shedding light upon them. Romero, aware that his life was in danger for confronting the authoritarian regime, struggled with his inability to keep people from being subjected to state-led violence. He lived Jeremiah's words. We look for peace, but find no good, for a time of healing where there is terror instead. Everywhere he looked, death and injustice appeared victorious, but he hoped against hope. He continued to bear witness to the good news of God by accompanying the people sorrowing for historical redemption. His spirituality even directed him into the terrifying places to confront the torturers and murderers, offering them words of forgiveness. He said, and so brothers and sisters, I repeat what I have said here so often addressing by radio those who perhaps have caused so many injustices and acts of violence, those who have brought tears to so many homes, those who have stained themselves with the blood of so many murders, those who have hands soiled with tortures, those who have calloused their consciences, who are unmoved to see under their boots a person abased, suffering, perhaps ready to die. To all them I say, no matter your crimes, they are ugly and horrible, but God calls you, God forgives you. In his final month, Romero appealed to President Jimmy Carter, urging him not to support the Salvadoran government with aid. Romero was troubled by the report that Carter was studying the possibility of providing military and economic aid to El Salvador's junta. In his letter, Romero pleaded that Carter not intervene in El Salvador's fate by providing military aid that would arm brutal security forces against a civilian popular movement. Because you are a Christian, Romero wrote, I ask that you prohibit military aid to the Salvadoran government, avoiding with it a major spilling of blood in my long-suffered country. Carter never replied. As violence escalated on March 23, 1980, Romero preached the sermon that cost his life. He made a special appeal to the soldiers and members of the security forces. You are slaying your campesino brothers and sisters. When a human being orders you to kill, the law of God must prevail. You shall not kill. No soldier is obliged to obey an order in violation of the law of God. No one is bound to obey an immoral law. In the name of God, then, and in the name of this suffering people whose screams and cries mount to heaven, I beg you, I entreat you, I order you, in the name of God, stop the repression. The day after preaching these words in the cathedral, the morning of March 24, 1980, a four-door Volkswagen approached the chapel of Divine Providence Hospital. The driver of the car opened fire on Oscar Romero, who was behind the altar preparing the gifts of the Lord's Supper, killing him. Romero never doubted the words spoken in his final sermon. Those who surrender to the service of the poor through love of Christ will live like the grain of wheat that dies. Faith compelled him to give his life for the poor, confident it would be accepted by God. President Carter said the murder of Romero was an unconscionable act. But the day after Romero's funeral, Carter approved an increase in non-lethal USA to the Salvadoran government, which included cargo trucks, radar, riot control gear, and night vision tracking equipment. Three days before Carter left office, he lifted the ban on U.S. arms sales to El Salvador. And more recently, new evidence suggests that Washington not only knew far more about the killing than it admitted, but it did nothing to investigate for fear of undermining its support for the Salvadoran government.
At Romero's funeral on Palm Sunday, held at the cathedral in San Salvador, the U.S.-backed Salvadoran military opened fire on 250,000 mourners gathered outside of the church, killing 50 individuals and injuring 200 others. The vicious attack did not prevent Ronald Reagan from taking up presidential powers and pouring unprecedentedly large amounts of military aid into El Salvador. El Salvador, thanks to the Reagan administration, became the single largest recipient of U.S. aid in Latin America at the time. In the U.S. Senate, Senator Jesse Helms, who was then the chair of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, heaped high praise on the Salvadoran Major Roberto de Busson and his men for being staunch allies in the fight against communism, the very person who authored the murder of Oscar Romero. Romero was killed for defending the rights of the poor and opposing state-led terror. When Romero is canonized, the U.S. government will need to face its role in the slaughter of an archbishop and explain why it ignored a saint's plea for an end to military aid. Our government will also need to explain why it supported the Salvadoran government's armed forces who were responsible for the rape and murder of four U.S. churchwomen, American churchwomen, in the same year as Bishop Romero was slain. Sadly, Presidents Reagan and George H. Bush allowed the training and support of the Salvadoran military with the equivalent of $1 million a day in the 12-year-long conflict a war that began with the murder of Oscar Romero and ended following the assassination of six Jesuit priests, the domestic worker and her daughter, Elba and Selina Ramos. El Salvador is still a land of poverty and violence that despite political peace faces an uncertain future. Presently, nearly half the population of El Salvador lives in conditions of economic misery with remittances from expatriated Salvadorans equaling 17% of the nation's GDP, about $5 billion a year. And gang violence, a culture exported from the United States, responsible for terrifying forms of criminality. Romero told the truth about the root causes of economic injustices the political violence forcing Salvadorans to flee their country, the human slaughter suffered by innocent citizens, and the lack of economic opportunities for the poor. These causes, for which Romero gave his life, are ours today, and they are evidenced in post-Civil War Salvadoran society and the vulnerable conditions of Salvadorans among other immigrants in the United States. In America, we are challenged to follow the example of Oscar Romero, what would he proclaim to a world increasingly divided by wealth and poverty? What would he say about the immigration debate impacting the lives of undocumented immigrants among whom you find many Salvadorans? Romero, who denounced the repressive behavior of government toward blameless people, would invite us to defend the human rights of undocumented immigrants and 800,000 dreamers among whom we find 28,000 Salvadorans. In the spirit of truth, Romero would urge churches to reflect a Christian witness that keeps families together, secures workers' rights, and paves the way for despised strangers to settle here, to become new Americans. In our Trumpian world, the slain bishop would say undocumented human beings and rejected foreigners tell the church to denounce state-led injustices, transform the unjust structures of society, and defend the minimum and maximum gift of God, life. He would remind us that immigrants who in America live in fear are arrested and often deported to violence, poverty, and death are strangers among us who reveal the mystery of Christ who becomes human vulnerable and poor. Border security and racist nationalism was not displaced the interest of the gospel disclosed by a crucified God. With Romero, we are tasked with casting the light of Christ on the hopes, anxieties, and grief of men, women, and children from other lands on our shores.
The United States currently has 650 miles of fencing along the southern border, record levels of staff for ice and border patrol, and a fleet of drones, among other resources. The U.S. government has spent more than $187 billion on immigration enforcement since President Reagan signed the regressive or restrictive immigration bill, the Immigration Reform and Control Act in 1986, which first made it illegal for employers to hire undocumented workers, along with strengthening U.S. border security. We spend billions of dollars on U.S.-Mexico border enforcement and imprisoning of men, women, and children in deplorable for-profit immigration detention centers, treating them like prisoners rather than suffering human beings in need of safe haven who beg us to transform our culture of cruelty. The American majority, of course, has a history of anti-immigrant sentiment against domestic minorities. Irish Catholics, Italians, Germans, Chinese, Japanese, Jewish humanity, Muslims, and others. Immigrants today arrive from all parts of the world, but anti-immigrant activity in the country is focused on Latinos. Researchers at the Southern Poverty Law Center explain today's anti-immigrant movement has Latin Americans in its sights. Nativist groups contend with little and no empirical evidence to back them up that Latin American immigrants contribute disproportionately to a host of societal ills, from poverty and inner city decay to crime, urban sprawl, and environmental degradation. As anthropologist Leo Chavez explains, Latinos are a threat, perpetual foreigners, alien citizens, despite American birth, they are to be feared. Trump peddles the alarmist view that America is under siege by Muslim terrorists, Mexican rapists, and Latino immigrant criminals. His proposal to build a wall across the southern border of the United States and the ideology that holds up undocumented persons as sources of economic hardship and cultural threat to dominant white society reflects an ignorant analysis and profound moral violence. The anti-Latino sentiment reflected by the idea of a border wall refuses the vision that the United States is a nation of immigrants that welcomes strangers to new life. Indeed, it signifies racism, bigotry, and moral deformity strengthened by the crippling ideology of white supremacy that justifies dehumanization, discrimination, exploitation, criminalization, and exclusion. Beneath America. In the time of Trump, following the example of Romero means embodying a faith that does justice denounces presidential comments singing the praises of white supremacist leaders and calling people from Haiti, El Salvador, and African nations, persons from shithole countries, unsuitable for America. With the church's beloved martyr, the so-called shithole nation, we must tell the truth pointing out that Trump, targeting immigrants from Haiti, El Salvador, and African nations for discrimination due to their complexion distracts attention from the dreadful gods of our time, money, power, luxury, and greed. In light of Romero's message linking faith and vulnerable human beings, imagine with me this means today congregations are to be places of prophetic resistance, contexts of radical hospitality, communities that embrace victims of power and speak truth to it. In these times, the spirit of the archbishop who handed the church what he found in prayer reminds us there is a political dimension to gospel witness waiting to be taken up in the American immigration debate, which begins for the church by admitting the God who asked Abraham to leave his country, who met Jacob's sons in Egypt in a time of famine, who was merciful to enslaved Hebrews, who accompanied the Holy Family, fleeing persecution into undocumented status in Egypt, commands us to love strangers. If we are to do justice, love mercy, and walk discerningly with God, 
then it's time to take a stand against the practices of morally indecent leaders who especially will the exclusion of immigrants of color and undocumented strangers who are mostly among the nation's hardworking poor. Political leadership guided by prejudice, ignorance, and hate must not keep us from tightly holding the hand of strangers threatened with deportation to conditions of violence, crushing poverty, and certain death. In the context of the unfolding immigration debate, what cannot escape our theological understanding in the life of the church is the mystery of the incarnation. The word made flesh is God's own great border crossing into our world that leaves no one beyond the reach of divine grace. In the face, then, of escalating violence in countries like El Salvador, forcing people to flee in search of safe haven, the word that God wants to speak to us cannot be greater than that found in the simple, simple message of Romero. Be kind. Be kind. Be compassionate. With Romero, let's confess Jesus was an undocumented person in Egypt, a worker with calloused hands and sweat-stained clothes, a victim of empire, a thorn for respectable religion, and an ethically innocent person, victim of state-led violence. In the circumstances of despised human beings take up the cause of crucified people, reject the culture of cruelty overtaking American society, sideline escapist piety in the church, and offer hospitality to despised human beings. Follow them on the paths of justice with peace. Let us live the beauty of a God who makes a way in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland by going then into the world, empowered by the witness of a Salvadoran martyr. In the name of the God who builds a road right through the ocean, stand up for justice, build bridges of friendship, and make local communities safe for communities of color. Defend the human rights of post-colonial migrants from other shores. Welcome them as brothers and sisters. Go into the world remembering the life, witness, and ministry of Oscar Romero, who for everyone is a pastor, a martyr, a prophet of mercy, justice, and love. Amen.